Evolutionists are in big trouble whenever they mention the Big Bang. For decades, these non-believing scientists were so certain that the universe had always existed in a steady state until they discovered what creationism had already predicted thousands of years ago. The universe had a beginning. Instead of just accepting this evidence for a creator, they believed nothing just exploded and created everything. And then, to save that theory, they had to invent something called the inflationary epoch when the whole universe defied Einstein's theory of relativity by expanding faster than the speed of light. Never mind the fact that something can't come from nothing and that everything that begins must have a cause. Why do these supposed scientists keep digging themselves deeper and deeper when the evidence is right in front of them? I had to investigate. At the beginning of the 20th century, our own Milky Way galaxy was, essentially, the entire universe as we knew it. It was suspected that there was more to the universe outside our galaxy, but limitations in our ability to measure large distance prevented any confirmation of this suspicion. The primary method of determining the distance to an astronomical body was via triangulation, measuring the angle in which a body appears in the sky once, and then again six months later when the Earth is on the opposite side of the Sun. Knowing these two angles and the distance between both observations, we can determine determine the distance to the object using the law of signs. Known as parallax, this was extremely useful in observing relatively local bodies in the galaxy, but it was, nonetheless, unable to measure distances involving angles smaller than 0.01 seconds of arc, which isn't even enough to determine distances to some objects well within the galaxy. In 1908, Henrietta Swan Leavitt noticed a specific relationship between the luminosity and regular pulse rate in a type of star known as a Cepheid variable. Seeing this relationship gave us what is known as a standard candle, and can also be used to determine the distance of a Cepheid variable by measuring its pulse rate versus its apparent brightness in the sky. This gave astronomers a tool to measure distances far greater than allowed through triangulation. Between 1922 and 1923, Edwin Hubble noticed Cepheid variables in a celestial smudge that astronomers called Andromeda. Previously referred to as a spiral nebula, the brightness of Cepheid variables in Andromeda showed that it was located far outside our own galaxy and was, in fact, another galaxy 2.5 million light years away. Hubble continued measuring these observations of the universe and measured the redshift of several galaxies. As discussed in episode 3, the speed and direction of a source of sound has a distinct effect on its tone. As a car approaches, it has one tone. As it passes by, there is a noticeable shift to a lower tone. This happens because as the car is approaching, each sound wave is being emitted a bit closer to the wave before it, which results in the compressing of the waves. Once it passes by, each wave is emitted a bit further away, resulting in the wavelengths being stretched out and resulting in a lower tone. Like sound, light also travels in waves. If a source of light is traveling toward you, its wavelengths are compressed, resulting in a lower wavelength, which means the light looks bluer. We call this blue shift. Likewise, when a light source travels away from you, the waves emitted from it are stretched out, resulting in longer wavelengths. This is known as redshift. What Hubble found was that the majority of galaxies are redshifted. What's more, the further away they are, the more redshifted they are. This means that the universe is traveling away from us in all directions and is accelerating the further away it gets. This this confirmed a cosmological model first formulated in 1922 and 1924 by Alexander Friedman to little attention until rediscovered in 1927 by Georges Lemaitre. Lemaitre was a Catholic priest and scientist who proposed that at some point in the finite past, all of the matter and energy in the universe was much closer. In 1931, he also postulated that it had at one point perhaps even been condensed into a small volume. The name Big Bang is popularly attributed to Fred Hoyle in a 1949 radio broadcast. According to most accounts, Fred Hoyle rejected the theory as some sort of implication for the existence of God. Three years earlier, in 1946, George Gamow published a paper on nucleosynthesis describing how radiation could recombine and become basic atoms after the Big Bang. He assumed that the majority of the early universe was radiation and theorized that in the process of recombination, microwaves would be released at a temperature of 50 Kelvin. This estimate was revised several times over the following years. In 1964, the last estimate came when Robert H. Dick, Jim Peebles, and David Wilkinson at Princeton University were preparing to search for microwave radiation as a means of testing their own theory. They felt that the cosmic background radiation would have been released along with matter at the Big Bang and due to billions of years of redshift would be at a temperature of under 5 Kelvin. It so happened that at the same time, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson were working at nearby Bell Labs experimenting on bouncing radio waves off of echo balloon satellites. 
After canceling out any potential radio sources, they continued hearing a low, steady, mysterious noise that persisted in their receiver. They soon found that no matter where they pointed their receiver, the mysterious noise persisted. They had discovered microwave background radiation at a temperature of 2.7 Kelvin. This confirmed the hypothesis of Dick, Peebles, and Wilkinson. In 1978, Penzias and Wilson were jointly awarded the Nobel Prize for Physics for their discovery, a discovery confirming yet another prediction of the Big Bang model. Knowing that matter warps both space and time we know that all of the matter and energy in the universe would effectively warp the space and time around it infinitely. Because of this, if the Big Bang began from a singular point smaller than the Planck length, we can't know anything about it before 10 to the negative 44 seconds after the Big Bang. On the Planck level, the universe does strange things, and the laws of physics as we understand them break down. So we don't know what happened at the Big Bang, nor whether or not a question of before the Big Bang even makes sense. The model itself doesn't propose that the galaxies themselves are moving away from each other, but rather that space itself is expanding between them. Since the apparent expansion of the universe is the result of an expansion of space-time itself, the speed of light limitation proposed by relativity is not violated. The galaxies are not traveling through a field. For this reason, it is also important to know that although the Doppler effect is used in understanding the concept of redshift, redshift is caused by the expansion of space-time and not the Doppler effect. This better explains what is known as the homogeneous distribution of matter and energy throughout the universe, as an explosion would distribute it all inconsistently. One goal of physics is to be able to mathematically describe the four fundamental forces in one formula. In calculating the types of temperatures that would have existed just after the Big Bang by such a concentration of matter and energy, physicists were able to unify three three of the four fundamental forces leaving gravitation as the sole outlier having separated in the earlier Planck era. This period of time stretching from 10 to the negative 43 seconds after the Big Bang to 10 to the negative 36 seconds after the Big Bang ends with the emergence of the strong nuclear force. In the inflationary model, it was this phase transition which triggered an immense amount of energy, creating a hot, dense mixture of quarks, anti-quarks and gluons, and a sudden rapid expansion called the inflationary epoch. It is in this period of time stretching from 10 to the negative 36 seconds to 10 to the negative 32 seconds after the Big Bang when the universe suddenly expanded rapidly from roughly one nanometer nanometer to about 10.6 light years. This was then followed by the emergence of the electroweak force marking the electroweak period. As fantastical as this model seems, it gave scientists a model by which to confirm the existence of gravitational waves. First proposed in 1905 by Henry Poincaré and predicted by Albert Einstein in 1916. On March 17, 2014, the detection of inflationary gravitational waves was announced by astrophysicists of the BICEP-2 collaboration. The excitement over this lasted only six months, however, as in September of 2014, the Planck team provided an accurate measurement of dust, concluding that the signal from dust is the same strength as that reported from BICEP-2. By January 30, 2015, the European Space Agency announced that the signal can be entirely attributed to dust in the Milky Way. On September 14, 2015, using the advanced LIGO detection, Detectors, the LIGO and Virgo scientific collaboration made the first direct observation of gravitational waves originating from a pair of merging black holes. The LIGO instruments have since detected several more confirmed gravitational wave events. In 2017, Rainer Weiss, Kip Thorne, and Barry Barish were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for their role in the direct detection of gravitational waves. As predictive and explanatory as it is, the Big Bang Theory is not a perfect model. As a result, like any scientific theory, it has been revised and will continue to be revised as we learn more about the universe which allows us to test more of its predictions. Regardless of this, the physics behind it are the same physics that send people to the moon and allows you to access the internet with the device you're watching this video on. Perhaps one day it will be replaced by a more explanatory and predictive model, but for now, it is another example of how creationism taught me real science. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may become the basis for a future episode. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.